welcome to the non-Columbus Day, to Indigenous Peoples Day, and to this assembly uh, around the topic of a Native Commons. Uh, we are incredibly privileged to have Tony Ibeta today, and you also see, um, many of you, that we have, in addition to the program, Karina Gould, uh, who's able to join and guide us tonight. Tony Abeta, as many of you know, is a Navajo Diné artist, Dine artist um, who is, takes up themes of politics and art in so many different ways in his art, touching upon ongoing conversations of what, what is considered sacred, from our relation to the environment to our conceptions of sovereignty. The current political climate has many Native American artists and many here um, all throughout UC Berkeley, of course, thinking about their role in creating powerful and thought-provoking artworks that speak to a global audience. Abeta's works do so primarily through paint, which becomes a medium in both the material and you could say communicative senses, through which to connect viewers to the emotional experiences of the New Mexico landscape. He's quoted, I like this quote, where he says, there exists a rhythm in the land where I was born that I'm beckoned to remember and then to paint. I as a performance person, I like the idea of rhythm in painting. <laughs> uh, he's a graduate from NYU with an honorary doctorate from the Institute of American Indian Arts in Santa Fe, New Mexico. And in 2012, he was awarded the New Mexico Governor's Excellence in the Arts Award, at which time he was also recognized as a native treasure by the Museum of Indian Arts and Culture. His works are included in the collections of the Smithsonian's National Museum of the American Indian, the Fine Arts Museum, Boston, the Heard Museum in Phoenix, the New Mexico Fine Arts Museum, the Autry Museum in Los Angeles, a new collection we just heard about, and many other public and private collections. He is currently represented by Blue Rain Gallery in Santa Fe, and it's a thorough privilege to welcome him here. As I said, it's uh, a double privilege, triple privilege, exponential privilege to welcome Karina Gould as well. As many of you know, um, Karina Gould Chochonye Ohlone is a co-organizer for the Indian People Organizing for Change and a Title VII coordinator for the American Indian Child Resource Center's Office for Indian Education. Karina Gould is also an activist, cultural leader, and teacher for many in what we call the Bay Area region and beyond. I think we'll hear more about her work as an activist and as a leader uh, in, in various projects tonight, including um, her work at Shell Mound. Here at UC Berkeley, Gould has been a guide and interlocutor <clears throat> as we find our way as a campus installed on a lonely ground and as we reckon with the political effects of that violent heritage. A true privilege to have you both here tonight and uh, we'll make the space yours. Thank you. Okay, so I'm mic'd up here, and uh, I want to wait. Uh, welcome Karina Gould here in this conversation. We're going to start off with. Um, I really wanted to bring the beginning of this conversation. A lot of the visuals you see tonight are going to be relating to artwork, but I wanted to talk about where all of that comes from. What's what inspires create creativity in an artist? Like, where do we get the the passion? Where does the in where, where are we inspired from to create and to make uh, art that is both uh, beautiful to, to look at but also has, has some impact and it has the ability to disseminate information. And so I wanted to bring it home to the Bay Area and I wanted to address some of the current issues in, in specifically the East Bay. And, and so I've been in Berkeley now for about five years and I've known about the shell mounds, but I didn't really know the specifics about them. And I know that there's a, there's a movie theater that's been built there. And then I started to learn a little bit more on my own about uh, some more sacred sites here. And I never realized the extent of the presence of the Ohlone people here in the East Bay. And so everybody said, hey, if you're gonna do a talk, you gotta get Karina to come and enter in some dialogues about what's sacred. And what is the the role of the community? And what do people know? And I'm looking at my own self in the mirror and say, I don't really know enough. Like I actually was back into to learn a lot more. And so 
uh, I watched some videos and, and did some research on the shell mounds. And so, uh, Karina, I wanted to, to first begin with a, a question about um, your, your activism in the shell mounds. And maybe you could give us some backstory on how, how all of this happened. What has been the historical trajectory of everything that is involved in historically, like when did this begin and where we're at now? And I'm gonna go run through some, some images on the back screen and we'll also take a look at a video that, uh, that uh, Karina collaborated on. So uh, tell me a little bit about some of the, the things that you've been working on and we'll go from there. Good afternoon. My name is Karina. I am the spokesperson for the Confederated Villages of Lashan. I am the co-founder of Indian People Organizing for Change and the co-founder for Segorite Land Trust. I want to thank Shannon for um, also coming up and introducing us. And I'd like to thank T Tony for inviting me to be here tonight to talk about these important issues. One of the things that we've been working on in the Bay Area around sacredness is also about knowing space and place and where you're at. And wherever you're at in on Turtle Island, you're in someone's territory. It's stolen land that has been here. One of the things that we've been working on in the last year is really to talk about how do we talk about being a guest on somebody else's land? How do we do those kinds of things? And how do we remember as indigenous people and people from other places about protocol? And how do we welcome people onto our land? And how do people are expected to uh, relate to the indigenous people from the territory on which they now live? And so that's one of the things that we talk about, about the sacredness, about protocol, and what does that look like? And so Shannon asked me, could we do the protocol today before we begin this? And I, and I said yes. So one of the things that we do about protocol is that we begin to think about what it would have looked like um, a couple of hundred years ago. Because if you think back, less than 200 years ago, these buildings were not here. The city of Berkeley was not here. The city of San Francisco was not here. All of the Bay Area was not the way it looks right now in a very short amount of time, it's changed. Thousands of people have flocked to live here in the Bay Area and call it their home, but don't realize that they are stealing, they're sitting on Ohlone territory. And so what does it look like now to come and to be a part of that territory? And what responsibilities does that bring? So one of the things that we did when we, uh, we worked with uh, UC Berkeley Performing Arts Department about talking about protocol, about asking permission to be on this land and to do the work that needs to be done in collaboration with the first people that are here. And so really talking about creating those things around the sacredness of the land and what is the land's responsibility to us and the reciprocity to the people that stay here. And so really that's what this whole work has been about. It's about creating those things that have always been here, the original teachings that go with those things, sharing those out to the people that are now in our territory, and creating these relationships a reciprocity to each other. Um, and so the Shell Mound work started about 20 years ago. And really, it's about looking at the history of Ohlone people in this area. Sometimes people will say, well, where have the Ohlone been? Why haven't you stood up and stood up for your sacred sites a long time ago? And when you think about the history of Ohlone people here in the Bay Area, you have to go back just a short amount of time to 1769 when the first mission in San Francisco that we were enslaved in. So while people were fighting on the other side of the country, the uh, American Revolution, the Spanish were just now coming up from Mexico to enslave our people. And that lasted only 99 years. And then we were set free. Free from what? All of the land had been usurped by the churches, and then Mexico decided to give huge land grants out to gentry. And Ohlone people weren't free. They had to go and work on those big ranches that those Mexican people had. And then the Mexican-American War happened, and there was this treaty, the Treaty of Guadalupe de Hidalgo. And in that treaty, it said that Indian people that were enslaved were, should get some land back so that they can go back about their own business. And that, was never ha that never happened. And then the state of California was created through this Western expansion and this gold rush period. And during that time, it was not about creating treaties with American Indians anymore. It was about a total extermination and annihilation of American Indian people. 
And so my ancestors, the way that they actually survived was to pretend that they were Mexican and lived on a ranch in Pleasanton until it was safe for them to come out. My mother, who died in 1978, went to boarding schools in Chamawa. Been not, and knowing that she was alone and telling us as we were children, but also it was that time where it was still not okay to be Indian. It was still a fearful time. It's not until my generation that it's been okay in the last 25 to 30 years to talk about being Ohlone in this, in this particular age and place. And so protecting our sacred sites has come about because we finally found our voice to tell people about the sacredness and not to worry about being killed off. And that's really where this has been. This is the trajectory that brought us to where we are now in saving and protecting these sites. Languages and songs and places, our dances, and all of those things were taken away when the shell mounds were wiped away as well. So we talk about the shell mounds, and it's not just one particular shell mound. There was five, 425 that used to ring the entire Bay Area. In 1909, this man named Nels Nelson, who worked for UC Berkeley, knew that over 100 years ago that these shell mounds were important and that he should put down on paper where these places were. He knew over 100 years ago that these important places to our people were going to be desecrated and demolished because of all of the development that was happening 100 years ago. And so it's because of his, uh, him putting that stuff down on a map that we were able to re-find where our ancestral burial sites are. UC Berkeley used our ancestral burial sites that are shell mounds, and we buried our ancestors in these huge mounds. The Emeryville one was the largest of the 425. It was over 60 feet high and 350 feet in diameter. So you figure a football field's 100, 100 yards, right? So if you figure three and a half football fields big, it was a huge place. It was a funerary place. It was a ceremonial place. It was a place where people came and traded. It was a place where you could see the Golden Gate, which wasn't the Golden Gate at the time. It was a place where we had ceremonies. It was a place where we danced. It was a place where we had our children. It was these village sites that were fishing sites all along the bay. And um, so in Emeryville in 1909, when we talk about gentrification today, we talk about all the people that are being moved out of the Bay Area we talk about it like this is the first time that happened. But actually, Ohlone people have felt gentrification for almost 200 years, right? Because we were moved out consistently by everybody, every wave that came through here. We are still here, and all of these cities and everybody else grew up around us. And so those shell mounds became important places for us to remind ourselves how we were tied to this land but not also just remind ourselves, but how to remind people that we still existed. In the 1950s, there was this whole thing about American Indian Relocation Act, pulling people off of the reservations and putting them into the cities with the promises of jobs and education and housing. And so hundreds of people from all over the country came and they lived in the Bay Area, not knowing that American Indian people already lived here. Even other American Indian peoples hadn't known that. There was this idea of, it was, it was not just a genocide of people um, in the way of killing folks off. It was a genocide of people by invisibilizing us even to other indigenous people. So today we see things like Shell Mound Street and Ohlone Way or Ohlone Park or Ohlone Veterinarian or there's an Ohlone Apothecary or there's these different places. There's a cigar shop. There's an Ohlone College. All of these things that, re that are supposed to represent the people that were here, but we're still here. And there are places that you would not believe that are sacred, right? When we did these walks in 2005 to 2008, we walked the entire Bay Area. We started in Vallejo and walked to San Jose and up the other side. 300 miles in three weeks. And from people from all over the world joined us on these walks walking 18 miles a day and stopping at these sacred sites using Nels Nelson's map and figuring out that these sacred sites were under bars and railroad tracks and schools and universities and streets and apartment buildings and stopping at all of these places that are still sacred to us and putting down our prayers. And for four years we did that. 
And at the same time that we were doing that, we had this great guy. His name is Wounded Knee Dale Campo. And he's an elder, and he's my brother, and he's a Miwok man that grew up in Vallejo, and he was protecting uh, our, the last 15 acres of open land on this Carquina Strait. And the Carquina Strait is up in the road by Vallejo. My ancestors are also Carquin speaking people, and that's on both sides of the Carquina Strait. Um, it was one of the last strongholds of our ancestors before they got pulled into Mission in Sonoma and Mission Dolores. We were also enslaved in Mission San Jose and Fremont. Um, that sacred place saved us. For 109 days, we took over that site in 2011 and stopped the bulldozers from coming in. We lit a sacred fire and we created a village site that was there that lasted and protected us. Although we thought we were protecting the land, we found out that the land was actually protecting us. It reminded us of how to be human again. It was people of all walks of life. It wasn't just Indian people that were living there. People came in the, into that gate and they put down tobacco in the sacred fire and they stayed there with us. And they brought ceremony there with us and they ate with us and they laughed with us and they protected that land and they found a place to be. Something that we all should know how to do. So someone walks in and they figure out what is their job. Am I good at recycling? Am I good at taking care of kids? Can I haul water? And people just found their niche. And everyone was just as important as everyone else. And money wasn't needed or required. So the Standing Rock that happened recently happened here in the Bay Area in 2011. For 109 days in Vallejo, we held that place that, that was sacred. And now, because we were able to do that, a federally recognized tribe created a cultural easement so that that land will never be destroyed so that there won't be buildings, so that people from all walks of life can go there. And they could sit along that quiet beach that my ancestors had for thousands of years. They can come there and they could participate in a salmon, uh, salmon ceremony that we just restored over the last couple of years to sing those songs that are important for the salmon to come back up, to clean the waterways that we all drink from. So those are the original teachings the shell mound walks, the shell people that are involved in the shell mound work are important, but it's not just the Ohlone people. It's everyone that lives in this territory now. It's their responsibility to make sure that they know where these places are and that they're protected and preserved. And, um, I just wanted to, to address a little bit about the um, the shell mounds and the development, the urban development that has occurred. If, if, if any of you are familiar with Shell Mound Way, it's sort of as you're coming, I think they call that area the grid, and there's a, a great big giant, um, you know, development, a mall and a movie theater. I recently went to the movie there, and, and, and I drove by, and, and I recognized that that's sort of the last remnants of what was in the earlier photograph of, you know, the shell mounds you know, which was a burial place. I know in the Southwest that, that uh, a lot of the Anasazis and also the Pueblo people buried their um, dead inside of the ash piles mm -hmm. because ashes are sort of a way of protecting them. And I think in the same way, that, that would have been the same reasoning that they would have buried in the shell mounds. So there's these sacred places. So when you're looking at a shell mound, m first thing that comes to mind is why isn't, these are graveyards, right? Why aren't they protect, protected by uh, NAGPRA, the Native American Repatriations and Graves Act? And w was there any actions to to uh, to try to, to to keep some of this stuff from happening, the the development on on sacred spaces and and um, and uh, villages? And can you talk a little bit about some of the current actions that you're involved with? Um, with uh, I think there's another one that's across the street. I tried to look for that, which is uh, across the street from Spangers, mm -hmm. and I think that was a show mound, but I just found a parking lot. Do you want to tell me a little bit about that? Yeah, so this is this is the Emeryville shell mound, and um, it was three stories high um, and 350 uh, feet wide, and it was actually five different shell mounds all together. It was like a hand with fingers. 
and we buried with soil and then shell. We ate a lot of shellfish, you know. Um, in the Bay Area, at some point, there was enough food to go around that nobody was hungry, and there was enough land to go around that nobody was homeless, and so um, everything um, and everyone um, had enough here. But we ate a lot of shellfish here. And um, so if people coming over from other places, from Europe, used this word called midden for our um, shell mounds. And that was pretty much what it was. So midden kind of is like a trash heap or a dump, you know? So that's what they use it, like kitchen trash or something. But that's not exactly what this is. Shell mounds are actually not just like um, from this area. People all over the world use shell mounds and we bury our ancestors in our shell mounds. Our shell mounds are layers of soil and shell and rock and our uh, funerary objects and over a millennium they grow bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, and so this one was rather huge because there was a point of people coming in from all different directions here. Um, this shell mound was first destroyed in 1924. Um, it had been saved because there was a dance pavilion put on top of it at some point. Uh, folks used to come. There was a train station called Shell Mound. Uh, it was a train station. There was a Shell Mound Park there. They put a dance pavilion on top of this. People were actually doing the polka and the Irish jig on top of my ancestors, literally. And But that's what saved it for a while. Then the archaeologist department and anthropology department of UC Berkeley was born and they began to tear it down. They used a lot of the shell remains. They hauled off a lot of our ancestors that's at Hearst um, or different places here at UC Berkeley and other places. But they used a lot of the remains that was there to pave the city streets of Berkeley and Emeryville. So literally, my ancestors are in the streets that um, were created here to create Berkeley and Emeryville. Um, because their soil was so rich, it was also used to uh, for, uh, for people's gardens. Um, and so you can imagine that my ancestors, because um, we also cremated ashes and parts of bone and stuff are in a lot of places in Berkeley. Um, oh, sorry, I forgot the rest of your question. <laughs> just, quickly, uh, just quickly also, do you want to speak a little bit about uh, th there's a remaining village site that you're currently working on protecting that's, uh, I guess that's over in university? Yeah, so we're working on the West Berkeley Shell Mound right now. And so, like I said, there's 425 shell mounds in the Bay Area. Most of them are under buildings and under railroad tracks. Um, the one in West Berkeley is actually partially under the railroad tracks there. It's on the 4th and University where Spangers, Spangers is and Spangers parking lot. That's not the only part of the shell mound. That's the last piece in open space. The shell mound actually goes under Truett and White and under the railroad tracks. It goes... Um, past Hearst, it goes uh, the other way for a couple of blocks. It was a massive amount of, of land. It was also, a, we talk about a landscape when we talk about places. We're not talking about just the place that we buried our ancestors. No matter where you come from in the world, a long time ago, everyone buried their ancestors right there in the village that they lived. It wasn't something that was unheard of. It wasn't like today when we have these cemeteries that are far removed from where we live. Uh, people actually buried in their backyards. So it was, it's similar to that, right? Um, but the West Berkeley Shell Mound is the first of all the shell mounds. It's the one that was the first place that we had a village that was a fishing village. Now, when we think about that, we think about a landscape that goes all the way down past Aquatic Park. We think about Strawberry Creek that runs through that property and Strawberry Creek that runs all the way up here through UC Berkeley and the village sites that sit up here on Ber UC Berkeley's place. So this, we're talking about a landscape here in Berkeley. So my ancestors just, just didn't sit in a village all day and do nothing. Our ancestors went all over the place and explored, just like everybody else, right? And so, but this place is really special because we have a particular um, way that we are supposed to be. Because our ancestors decided that this was a particular place that we were supposed to put our, uh, our pers permanent um, housing down in, per se, um, and to launch our first boats there, and to have our first children there, and to hear their first laughter there, and to, um, that there was also this particular way that we were supposed to be. That's what creates the sacredness of it. Because there's stories that tell us that when you sit there and you do the ceremonies there, 
that there's this place that people went to, maybe today. Who went to Alcatraz this morning? One person. I'm, a, I'm a surprised you're still awake. <laughs> Many people on Indigenous Peoples Day or Thanksgiving go to Alcatraz for a sunrise service. And for us as Ohlone people, Alcatraz represents a place that our ancestors went um, as a spirit when they passed away. For four days, they sat on that rock and they listened to the ceremonies that was happening in their village sites and they got ready to go home through the Western Gate. And that Western Gate is Golden Gate where the Golden Gate Bridge is now. So that these particular um, shell mounds are actually lined up so that when people do ceremony for their dead, that their ancestors go to that rock and then go out the gate. So this is a particular place that should, ha should be protected and preserved. Um, the city of Berkeley has already landmarked it. It's a state historic landmark. It qualifies for a national historic landmark. It is private property. When we talk about today uh, preserving and protecting something, if it's private property, those private property laws um, have more say than our laws of protection and preservation. Ohlone people are not federally recognized, and that's a whole different discussion to have, and we don't have enough time for that. But that means that we don't have the protection under NAGPRA that federally recognized tribes do. Um, and so that means that we have to work with everybody to do this. We've been working on preserving and protecting this site for many years, but it came up for development in March of last year. We were able to stop, um, get folks out to the zoning board in Berkeley, able to gather people up to write 1,779 letters in opposition of the project. The project builders got five in their favor. Two of them was their lawyers. So we've been doing a lot of good, uh, good organizing about trying to stop pr to protect this. But that place is still a meeting place. Today we had people down there painting. Folks came down and said prayers. Um, we have had people sharing food. People have, over, have had overnight prayer vigils there. We've gathered there on numerous occasions. But we still, as Ohlone people, go there and we pray. It's still a place that I can take my grandchildren where they can touch their feet on the ground. If we allow a five-story building to go up there, where do we do that? And then we're talking about uh, the, cr the final part of the, the completion of the genocide that was started 200 years ago for Ohlone people. If we have no place to touch our feet and to say our prayers at our original places, then we will be gone in the next generation. So it's my d duty and responsibility to make sure that we have a voice in protecting and preserving those places, that we have a place to dance and to sing, and that my grandchildren are able to bring back those languages and songs, and not just for us, but for everybody that lives here now. Karina, I just want to—I want to echo that, uh, you know, appreciation for you being here and telling us all about the shell mounds, and it's—it's it's enlightening to know that, you know, living in the Bay Area, I didn't really know about all of the details of this. So it's—it's—it's it's, it's a, it's a—it's a great opportunity to have connection to what's sacred and to source and to community and to the the historical native, you know, um, you know problems that have, have happened here in the East Bay. So I want to thank that. I'm going to jump into this um, this video here. One minute. Real What's quick. that? Give me one minute. Yeah, you got one it. One minute. <laughs> I know, I'm, I'm just like Tony, throwing Tony off here on his game. He's got stuff that he wants to show you. But one of the things that, that I wanted to do is we um, had a good friend of mine created this thing. It uh, says, Si Uti Ishi, and it means uh, water is life in our language. And as part of the protocol that we do here is that we offer gifts for our relatives that are doing work on our land um, and hope that we can create a reciprocal relationship um, with one another, that this isn't just a shot in the dark and that we just don't see each other in a way that you know we're here, but that this relationship continues to benefit both of us in the future. And so I'd like to offer this gift to you today before I leave the stage. Oh, that'd be fantastic. Hey, I'm honored.
check this out. <laughs> Look at that. Indigenous Peoples Day. Um, so what we got here is a great video. I'm going to go ahead and maybe we can dim the lights a little bit. Maybe we don't need to. About 12 years ago, that's when we first started doing the community organizing work um, with Indian people organizing for change. And we started getting phone calls from contractors and from carpenters. People tell me, they, hey, there's a burial over here. Did you know that they found this over there? So in Brentwood, we found out that they moved 366 bodies, 13 bodies in San Jose. The big Emeryville project, um, where it's on top of one of the largest shell mounds in the Bay Area. It was 600 feet in diameter, 30 feet high. It was on an 1859 survey map. As people were coming into the Bay Area, it was a point of reference. So it was a huge shell mound. Emeryville decided that was during the dot-com era, and they decided that they wanted to bring commerce into Emeryville. And by doing that, they were going to build this mall. We asked them to clean it up and to leave it as it is, leave it as a sanctuary for uh, Native people, for Ohlone people, talk about the history. They decided, no, that they, that's not what they wanted to do. And pretty soon they were pulling up hundreds of bodies. When they piled in to put the movie place in and where the garage is, they piled through a baby cemetery. And so what they decided to do was to put that horrible little tiny mound with the metal basket on it, and that's supposed to represent thousands of years of my ancestors. Kind of makes you think twice about going to the movies over there, going to shopping over the next shopping center. Um, <coughs> so I'm going to jump into the second part of this um, presentation tonight, which is really okay. So we we determine that there's indigenous people here in the Bay Area, and that there is a connection to the sacred, to ceremony, to uh, a community of people that are surviving through you know everything from genocide to um, displacement, urbanity, all of these things. And so um, what am I doing here is I, I moved to Berkeley. I'm a painter. I live in Santa Fe, New Mexico. Uh, I'll show you some of my artwork. But I moved out here and just kind of to find some, some peace and the connection to, you know, a, a place where I could, you know, get a break from New Mexico. And, and, and things change. Like so much has happened in like, let's say, the past four or five years that I've been here. And one of the things is I came here to escape Santa Fe, New Mexico and work and doing shows and, you know, a community of people that drive me crazy there. And I get here and it's perfect. It's beautiful. And the sun's beaming in my window. And I'm turning on the NPR radio and there's this thing, Standing Rock, which is going on in, in, um, in North Dakota. And, um, you, you know, the Dakota Access pi Pipeline. And I realized I couldn't just sit there on my couch looking out at the beautiful bay window and, and say, wow, man, I, I really had to participate in this. I had to be part of that. And so I um, packed up about, well, I think, 35 melons that I got from Berkeley Bowl. And um, I got, you know, some coffee and, uh, you know, some bottled water. And I drove my van, you know, just by myself. And I went out there. And it changed the whole it, it kind of had such an impact on me that it made me like, you know, I, I, I became an activist. Like, it wasn't like I've been an activist my whole life, that, that there's so much that I've been engaged in my life. And, but I got to a point where I really started to look at, you know, where, where could I put my efforts in terms of my, um, my passion? And so this is basically the first day that I get out there, and one of the actions was... Uh, you know, they stopped the bulldozers from bulldozing over through some, some land and through some um, sacred sites. The dogs had just attacked everybody and bitten people up. And um, so as, as a um, 
as an artist, I went out there and, and there were already a bunch of people that I knew that were coming out. Most of them were artists and then they were responding in the same way that I was. They were passionate about something that they cared about that was environmental, that was cultural, and always tied to what, you know, pr the preservation of what is sacred. And so uh, a, a good friend of mine was out there and he was in this little, you know, small, tiny yurt. And his name was Chinupa Hanska Luger. And uh, he, he's a, um, a Rikara Hadatsa and Standing Rock Sioux artist. He's native. And so he started working on all of these actions and, and projects you know, using his art to be able to disseminate information. And so he started, you know, creating from barrel, oil barrels and tires and um, these uh, polyurethane uh, buckets. He started creating, you know, these black snakes. And, and he's, he's really famous for being a, a pretty fantastic ceramic artist. So the heads of the snakes are really rendered so beautiful with craftsmanship. And they have these, um, uh, you know, fangs and teeth. And so he also jumped right into the next phase of it, which was, you know, the actions that were birthed out of, uh, out of Standing Rock. So he put together these um, uh, actions with mirror shields where he had everybody create and make mirror shields. And then when they went up to the front lines and engaged the, the, the militarized police, they showed them themselves so they would see their own reflection and sort of in a way of, of letting them know we are you and you are us and we're all human beings but simultaneously um, it's powerful in that you know they, they, they reflected the sunlight and light and you, you know the other side and so I would just I love being there and watching uh, you know he was working with Red Warrior Camp there and and basically, they were really simple. And so he had a small video he put on, on Facebook and social media, which was, you know, you take this mir mirrored uh, acetate, glue it to a board, cut two holes, and it, it, it would be, you could form a wall of fence of, of people. And so when they went up to the front lines, it was a different time then, too. Like, you could get up on the front lines without, you, you know, seeing, you know, all of these uh, hummers, and there were helicopters, and there were... Uh, armed guards and and it progressively got much more difficult to have any sort of you know dialogue with anybody so um, I know his earlier work so he was working with um, and all of these slides I'm going to jump into are really about art and how do we respond to what is the uh, the conversation about contemporary Native American art and what inspires us as Native art and most of the artists that I'm going to show you today are part of the a group of uh, really creative people that I curated into an exhibition, which is at the Sam Malou Foundation, uh, just uh, east of Los Angeles. Uh, I guess it's called Alta Loma, California. That show is up, and uh, and uh, you, you should get a chance if you get a chance to go see it. It's up till February, and so he started making these um, boom boxes, and they were these you, you know really hyper native boom boxes with um, spirit catchers and headdresses and uh, he called them stereotypes and so and I liked them and, and I thought well maybe I'll get them to make me one of them and but I wanted a great big one of those great big ones you know, boom, 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 you can carry it around like this and uh, I, I never I never got this one I, I saw it in the show he did but he ended up taking them climbing up on the ladder and then putting on some loud sort of progressive um, native hip hop music and then dropping them and smashing them all. It's sort of like they, you know, basically smashing stereotypes, uh, perceptions of how people look and view Native American, uh, you know, culture. And so he felt like it was absolutely necessary to smash these as, you know, sort of a metaphorical um, uh, action to say, you know, they don't exist, they're gone, and they're ephemeral. And he did videotape them, so there's 10 of them he smashed into little pieces. But they're really beautifully rendered, like they're made out of clay, uh, they have beadwork on them, they're hand-painted, uh, they've got this, you know, feathers and everything, and he smashed all of them, and I was like, damn, I wish I would've got the big one that he never made me, but um, there's, there's a photograph of him uh, submerged in water. This is a photographer by a um, young Chimawevi artist named Kara Romero. Uh, she is um, 
from uh, the Mojave uh, Desert. She moved to Santa Fe, New Mexico. And another artist who was also inspired through the conversations that, that began at Standing Rock about oil and water. And so this is a series of work that she did of traditional native uh, uh, dancers and they're submerged in water into this sort of abyss of, uh, of um, liquid, this aqueous place. And, and the way they sort of fall into these, these um, you know, these pools is, you know, she wanted a relationship between, uh, you know, water and mystery and sacredness. And um, when I first saw this photograph, I said, man, that, I don't think I've ever seen an American Indian photographer tackle like an underwater photo photography scene. And, and I knew these, these dancers because uh, they were they were friends of mine, and they danced the corn dance at the in the pueblos in New Mexico, and it's unbearably hot. It's like so hot, like a man. I'm glad I'm not out there dancing. I'm here in the shade watching this, and it gave me the immediate response to like this sort of almost a spiritual bliss that occurs, you know, once they were submerged. And so she shot like 12 of these photographs, and this is the one that I always liked the best. Uh, this is her photograph called Ka which is a uh, Pueblo woman, uh, really a, a woman that's directly tied to earth and to clay. And, um, you know, sort of from the mythology of the Mother Earth and sort of that symbol of being a maternal Mother Earth figure, but also in a, rendered in a way that's almost very, very sexy, you know, in terms of how she depicts them. There's a certain power to her work. and. Uh, again, she's in this show that I curated. I just these are really large-scale photographs, uh, which she stages. She puts them all together. And um, uh, there's another artist. Um, I, you know, like all of us, we have a Facebook or we have Instagram, IG, as we call it. And I'm on there and I'm scrolling and I'm like, ah, this is funny, funny. You know, um, I get it. And then I realized I started looking deeper at the work of this this artist, and uh, his name is Stephen Paul Judd. And so he was sort of taking these old photographs and putting in some of these. And th they were kind of, you know, kitschy and fun. And But I started, like, taking them a little bit more serious because he started posting up some of these images. And they were funny. And they were, they were really accessible for people on social media. You look at them and you're like, ha, ha, funny, Frankenstein. Ha, ha, look at that's a bomb old snowman. Oh, those are the minion dudes. And so... When I looked at them, I realized that these are really like images about colonization. They have a lot to do with what, uh, you know, Native Americans have been dealing with in terms of colonization of, of culture, but also of media and, and how even our minds and, 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 you know, our children are more familiar with some of these figures and characters uh, than they are about real traditional uh, stories and mythology. So more people, more kids, if you ask like a young Native American kid, they probably know more about Star Wars and they'll tell you the name of the planets and the protagonists and everything. And But, but they probably can't tell you about their own origin myths. So for me, they're images that, t there's a great conversation that happens about them because they're, they're fun, they're accessible, they're, f you know, they're engaging. And so I, I called him and I said, hey, I want to I include you in on this, uh, this exhibition that I'm doing in California. Uh, do you have a website? And he's like, no, nah, I don't have a website. I've just, um, you know, I'm, I've only got, you know, my images on Instagram. So I'm like an Instagram artist. And I really love the fact that he's using social media as his platform for disseminating his information to people because it's, he's not working with a gallery. He's taken incredibly serious. He's lecturing all over the country. He just did one of the Smithsonian in New York and uh, uh, a few other museums. In fact, when I, I'm, I'm going to see him in about another couple of weeks at the UC Riverside Symposium. And he's a filmmaker. And he's working on short films and videos. And again, he has this huge audience of people who follow the work. They know who he is. and it's basically 
if you look at it, I, when I look at the work, I say, wow, this really is a little bit deeper than I thought. It is funny, but in a way, it is, it is a, a dialogue, catalog, a catalyst for a dialogue about uh, colonization. And, you know, what, what are these traditional values of, of uh, people and the youth and stuff? So I'm going to play a quick video. I hope it's going to be quick. Aki, Aki, Chakwan Ian. We come along, Kisam Sonanak, Wuchi, Akoma, Kitahan. Pionk, Kwa Wat Ki, Wuchi, Kiwan, Kwa Pam Kuki. We you ti yok anak, Ta wika tomawank. Kachanai, Mata Kawahoa, Yuski Tompak, A Pamo Ko, Wa Ata Nis Mashoi. Haki mas man ki wawa kanichonan. Kataya mawa wat kwanonak. Aki ayatu wayak. Kwa aki o kusawak i mantu. In kakiha tat wuchi witapotan sayakat matan ayotama winak. Matamai kati kwanonak. Piyosh in wachonamak. Hayi sashan. Tiakwash wo sho kwanawak. Tanit ni mata unun. Tapin iawash wo chi na natai. Ni tato jakwan i. Wachonamak mashoyash. Mashoyash akweni wo kwat pamasaswak. Na yashawak. Ayanamawik nataya sanawak. Chakwan awi machi chakwan maskawa chak. Next cut, Matapawak of Kawi Tabatamawak. That's an Indigenous Peoples Day video. But y you can see, so it's, um, it gets your attention. It's funny, and it's easy to sort of, you know, respond to that. But you're also getting the point. You get it. Like, there's, there's a lot there. Um, I'm going to keep to the clock, so I'm going to speed it up a little bit. I may go a few minutes over, and if I do, I apologize for that in advance. But there's all this great stuff I want to show you. Nicholas Galanin. Nick, Nick is an um, Aleute, Northwest Coast um, native, who's been working with... Um, uh, he's really a sculptor and a performance artist, and he does videos and installations. When I looked at his work, I was like, wow, this stuff is just super powerful. And so when I first started looking at the work, I said, you know, here we are dealing with like the idea of trophy and sort of this, you know, a rug and also the idea of like a spirit animal. So, you know, he sort of connects these two things together. It's about perspective. And he did this video of, um, of himself skinning uh, like a full wolf that was uh, somebody had taxidermy. So, and so he's sitting there with a razor blade and he's cutting it open. And then you look at like how ridiculous is it to skin a dead wolf that's been taxidermy. And then I thought about it. Well, it's as ridiculous from the native perspective to look at it, to stuff a, a live animal or to kill an animal and stuff him as a trophy is equally as ridiculous from a different perspective. So how do you want to view and look at, you know, that idea about indigenous perspective versus, you know, a much more sort of you know, Western idea about like trophy animal hunting for not, you know, not for a meal, but as, you know, have, you know, a trophy you hang above your fireplace or something. Kind of weird and creepy. Um, so, you know, they're, they're half alive and they're almost like looking like they're sort of comfortable, but, you know, the other half of them, they're sort of emerging from this trophy place. And, and um, I just thought, wow, these, these are pretty amazing. Um, He's dealing a lot with, with, again, what is sacred? What do we determine as sacred iconography, ritual, um, masks, and reinterpret it as people collect these things, right? They take them home, they put them on their wall, they're decorative. So in, these, in this series, he's also making, calling them what they are, like, you know, put some decorative china uh, motifs on them. So they really are decoration. And so they've sort of lost their identity as Northwest Coast tribal ceremonial masks. Uh, I thought this was amazing when I saw it. 
So he's got a full 25-foot totem pole. He's painting it red. And he takes it and hacks it up and chops it up like firewood. And I think this one's called, I think it goes like this. And so what you're looking at is not a totem pole he carved. These are carved in Malaysia, appropriated and sold as things you put in your backyard by the pool or something. So they're actually these, um, these, you know, they're, they're, they're not ceremonial. These, these are, you know, carved by clans, by, you know, families. There's pride. They have a ceremony when they erect them. But these are sold by the dozens. You can order them online for, I think, about $600. And so he's taken them and reappropriated them, turned them into something utilitarian like firewood. Uh, Northwest Coast handcuffs. And so the tradition of Northwest Coast wood carving is, you know, it's a meditative, you know, kind of process of, of carving something. And you learn it from your father, your grandfather, from a community. And this is how you participate in your culture. In this case, again, he's got one of these masks that's produced in Malaysia and um, sold to the trade. And so he's kind of destroying that. And as, as this goes on, I'm going to cut it a little short because of time. He takes the, uh, the chippings of that, and he forms it and creates his own mask and then creates a performance where he dances with it. So he takes it back and turns it into something sacred. So he, he, he then takes what's misappropriated and appropriates it for his own you know, ceremonial ritual. And so you'll see him gathering up all of the little pieces there and um, so so just like all of these artists I'm showing you I just I, I get really charged up to see to see how other American Indian artists are inspired where are they getting all of this from and this didn't exist 10 years ago I mean people have been creating and making art but the level of artwork that's being produced today uh, this is a collective post-commodity. Uh, they're a group of artists um, that are uh, mestizo, Navajo, and um, gosh, um, I'll have to remember what the, the other guy's uh, tribal affiliation is. But really, um, they're famous because they've, they've done a number of really large-scale projects. This one they did which is uh, balloons that they put up uh, that cross over between the uh, Arizona, US border and into Mexico. And so these balloons were sort of devised, you can buy them online, and these the balloons are created to scare birds away. Like so if you wanna put them in your backyard, they'll keep the birds from eating you know, the fruit from your trees. But they've been proven to be incredibly ineffective. And in which case, it's the same thing. It's sort of like creating this this watchful eye and, and to sort of deter, uh, you know, immigrants from crossing the border. It's th th there's a certain futility that comes with that. And so, they, you know, they, they did this actually in 2015 on October 9th. So this would have been Indigenous Peoples Day 2015 that they erected these balloons and, and had, you know, a ceremony and, and everything. And they, you know, they erected them on both sides simultaneously and left them up as a performance. So um, I just, you know, the level that I, I believe American Indian ind indigenous art has, has gone is begin it's getting more and more exciting every time I hear about a new project uh, that somebody's engaged in. I'm like, wow, that is brilliant. Like, it's just, w we're at what I refer to as sort of next level Indian art. Uh, you can see that's the border, the yellow line right there. And um, Nani Chacon. Nani Chacon is the sister of Raven Chacon, who is a member of the last collective that I showed you, which is post-commodity. And dealing with a little bit of a different issue, but also with, um, you know, a, a sort of borders, American and Canadian border. And she's addressing specifically missing indigenous women, uh, murdered and exploited uh, women. And so this project she did, she had women from both Canada and the United States uh, 
send in a single earring. As you know, most women know in their jewelry box they've lost an earring, and so they have one remaining earring. So all over uh, the country, she had people like sending in these packages, and they created the this installation of one single earring, and it's sort of like to honor. Uh, you know, lost sisters. You know, this is this is you know a, a a powerful installation when you're thinking about you know the the connection between women and also how you know one really is connected to the other in terms of y you know the their beliefs, their ceremonies, and and specifically indigenous tribes. And many tribes live right on the border. So if you're I think if you're Cree, you could be Can Canadian Cree or you can be American. It's sort of like you're connected on both sides of that border. So it, it, it and then they did another one which was also dealing with uh, Mexico and, um, and also United States as well. Uh, another collaboration, very interesting collaboration that was done about, I think it was like five or six years ago uh, for a large dome piece. This is a collaboration between a Navajo artist, uh, Bert Benali, and the Chinese dissident artist, Ai Weiwei. And they collaborated to produce this for a project called Time. And um, so if you look at the bicycles, those are crushed um, ceramic vessels that, uh, that I had put into these sacks and had them sent out to the reservation. And then there's a performance that occurs where all of these things are lit. These fires are lit simultaneously filmed from a drone and in a place called Coyote Canyon. And it's about sort of this temporal uh, experience that everything is sort of ephemeral. And if you look, it's sort of dark there, but he's created a sand painting with four directional colors. And it, it's sort of, you know, sort of a, a version of, of Ai Weiwei's sand painting of the bicycle, which is sort of the main way of getting from one point to another. Uh, in, in Chinese culture, everybody rides bikes. Um, and in this case, you know, he's merging those two worlds together. And it's a really beautiful video. You can go online and, and take a look at the video itself. And it was produced to go into a great big, giant, huge, immersive dome, which made it experiential with the soundtrack that was put together for it. Um, Kent Monkman. So Kent's really an interesting character artist. He is uh, Cree and Matisse, and he uh, defines himself as belonging to the Two-Spirit Nation. Uh, most of his art is n not without addressing gender, and specifically, um, this is just a, a sort of a, a, a relic of a performance that he did, he ended up, just this summer, he married this uh, fashion designer whose name was um, Jean-Paul Gautier. So that headdress was designed by Gautier in like, let's say the late 90s for somebody. And given the political climate of appropriation of Native American sacred religious attire, we're, we're looking at something that's kind of politically incorrect, and this was part of a museum exhibition uh, of um, Gautier's sort of spectrum of all the work. And he wanted to include it in there, but he felt like he was going to get some flack for doing so. So uh, he, he collaborated and worked with, um, with, with Kent to, uh, and he has this alter ego. I think it's uh, uh, Mischief, Mischief Testicle, uh, Mischief White Testicle or something. It, it, anyway, so. <laughs> Uh, he defines himself as queer, but, but you know, two-spirited, which is really sort of the native perspective about, you know, uh, the spirit retaining both female and, and male attributes and also, um, and, and all of the art responds to that. You know, it's all about sort of dealing with um, gender, like I said. So this painting right here, I always thought it was really funny, but for sacred directional trucks, and, he, and, and he, he appropriates all of these Western landscapes that are like by Bierstadt or Thomas Moran or, you know, these, these very traditional 
Western artists that paint romantic landscapes. And so then he incorporates his own uh, narratives in them. And so what we have here is uh, called Gathering of the Four Erections. And so you've got four guys, um, sort of like an Indian guy, a, a white cowboy guy, and I don't know who the other two are, but they're all sort of congregating in what they might call a circle communion or whatever we want to call it. But, uh, but, but it's funny to look at and laugh, but you, you also see like, you know, is, is this some kind of a ceremony? Is this or something sacred going on? Is this native? And, you know, those things are, are part of Kent's, like, you know, the dialogue that he's having is really a little, a, a little bit challenging. So incarceration, militarized police, urbanity. These are real places um, in his paintings. These, are, these places really exist. There's photographs of them, even with some of the cars out in the driveway. But uh, again, he's, he's, he's looking at you know, this sort of conflict between masculine and feminine. And so you know, the, that, that sort of world within incarceration where you know, it's it's sort of one gender is, is sort of what's happening there. And um, so a lot of the work is is about that sort of loss of the feminine within Native culture and Canadian culture. It, you know, a lot of these guys are wearing sports jerseys. They got tattoos. There's almost sort of this, um, you know, uh, over masculine approach to overcompensating, and there's destruction, and there's the destruction of a great many things. He's got images of Catlin in there, um, of spirit animals, uh, religious figures. I forget who that angel is. It's Archangel. I forget who he is. And so, and I hope I'm not going over too much time, but I'm trying to show you guys a lot. Uh, just really interesting work, and, and, and again, I wanted to sort of bring that to your attention, and a lot of this is all inspired from just from community, from like what's happening, how do we respond to the political climate that we live in, and what are we creating from that? How do we make art that responds to aggression, to uh, sexuality, to uh, oppression, and to... Um, the loss of, 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 of our culture. And so another guy, a uh, Navajo guy, and this is uh, a, f a fellow friend of mine, and his name is Craig George. And I curated him to the show in, in California uh, in, at Maloof Foundation as well. When I saw these paintings, I'm like, wow, traditional uh, dancers riding a bike in urban environments. And I thought, well, that's cool. But then I had some dialogue with him. Again, real places, real tags. Uh, he moved to uh, East LA. He was kind of coming, emerged out of this sort of gangbanger uh, culture and he was a street artist. And so he knew a lot of the Native Americans in the city so he started talking with them and so he ended up painting them as they would be back in their homeland because a lot of people would be saying well I'm going back home for ceremony I'm going to head back to Hopi I'm going to head back to the Navajo Nation I'm going back to San Felipe Pueblo outside of uh, Santa Fe so each one of these people is engaged and they're in transit they're in momentum they are on their way to so that there is a sense of connection to their respective homelands even in a place like Los Angeles, or um, uh, he does he does a lot in Phoenix, Arizona as well. So we're really talking about Native Americans in you know immersed in urbanity, and so how do you, we retain a connection to ceremony and to traditional uh, practices? Uh, and it, we just have to you know look at what the context is. I, I think the work's incredibly powerful and and very important. Uh, Pueblo artist Diego Romero, who is a ceramic artist, and uh, a lot of he's he's sort of carrying on the tradition of what would be membrano uh, uh, pictorial bowls. Th these were originally burial bowls of the membrano culture. The date to about uh, 1600 and uh, 14 to 1600 or so, and so he's 
creating contemporary narratives in these bowls. So if you recognize that is from the um, Planet of the Apes, I think it's the final sequence, Planet of the Apes. And, uh, but it's a, it's a Native American guy. Um, he does a lot of these paintings that refer to the Anthropocene. <coughs> so you're looking at neighborhoods like, uh, kind of like Pueblo style Santa Fe neighborhoods, cars moving all the way around the vessels. The last stratification is sort of the um, burial underworld. So there's like all the stuff that's underneath the, the ground buried, like pots and bottles and you know the the history of of who we are and where we are at now. So there, there's a stratification of the different worlds that is part of his work. Um, he's looking towards you know at a lot of um, um, moche stirrup vessels, except he's incorporating. He, he started making these things. Um, this is what's that? Does it, who, who knows what cat that is? God, thank you, Garfield the cat. Uh, Homer Simpson, Bart Simpson, and uh, th this final image is of, you know, I sent, I posted a picture on Facebook. I was in, I was there for my sister who died in, in January. She, she had died of alcoholism and I was out there for a funeral and she'd worked in DC for years and years. And so I'm sitting there and somebody took my picture and I looked just like this. I was also broke up with my girlfriend. And so I had this, and Diego just looked at it, and he, he told his wife, Carrie, he says, I got to make a bowl out of that, make that bowl of Tony. And it had a lot to do with the political climate of the day. Like, you know, um, Trump had just been elected. I had my heart broken, and my sister died. And two, day, two damn days later, one of my friends in, in Italy shot himself. So I look at that bowl, and I'm like, whoa, that thing is really heavy, and it's raw and real and authentic. And... And, um, but here it is, you know, um, interesting. This is my work. Uh, I, I did this big mural at the Heard Museum. It's a large scale abstraction, uh, which is dealing with sort of a abstraction of, of uh, Navajo creation myth. And we emerged through this sort of labyrinth of four different worlds, insect worlds, bird world. And, uh, and so we're, we're getting into this final world, which is called the glittering world, and all the birds are coming up and emerging. And there's like this little area in the top. There's like a small emergence place where we enter into the fifth world and where we would see the cosmos and we would see plants would be able to like emerge and seeds would sprout. And, and so th here we, that's where we are. But it became like uh, this, this sort of abstraction. It's all kind of my own way of of drawing the mystery of what, I don't really know how to describe, like what are those four worlds? What is that, that the idea and who are the protagonists of you know, the underworld and, and what is that story? And so I can depict it best by just feeling what, what it might feel to be like spores and seeds and roots and insects and plants and all of these things that are coming out that are just part of the great mystery. Um, Painting I did this past year, a uh, large scale piece called, this is the first in a series of around 10 of them, which will take the next decade to finish. I'm gonna try to do one every year. And this painting is um, kind of dealing with the political climate of today. And it's called Dark Carnival because it looks exciting, it looks fun, it's very, um, tantalizing in terms of there's like candy corn and fidget spinners and and there's like these flowers are being used as target practice but there's something very dark and ominous at hand so it has a lot to do with like where we're at right now there's all this dark ominous stuff happening we're totally distracted by what looks sweet and what's colorful and what's like appealing to us like we're like you know, yeah, look at that. That's there's something there's something very beautiful about the painting. That's got all this like great rich colors, and when you look at it, there's also these cr grenades, and there's like these sort of mysterious dark things happening. And I put big bumblebees and um, these cats from you know that cats from the uh, fireworks. So to me, it was about you know there, there's an explosive nature to it and so I'm going to document every year as everything goes on and 
transpires in, with new administration, with um, you know these Im climate change and and um, environmental issues. This will continue the catalyst for my own work. This is what inspires me. Is is all of this together? Uh, a video that I did that's basically animating everything that you saw. So it's like taking this painting, making them spin, rotate, pulse, bringing a drawing to life. So this is a really big, large projection, and all of that moves and undulates and changes. Uh, a collaboration I did with an artist named Jake Frawa. Um, uh, this started off as you know, looking at, at actions and, and activism at Alcatraz and you know, as a tourist ex destination. And then we ended up like, I said, I said uh, Alcatraz, he said Standing Rock. I said Alcatraz, Standing Rock, and so we did both, and that, that's kind of where that came from. So it's such, it was really meant to be a travel poster. Uh, a painting that I did on the last, this is a, about the last day of Standing Rock. It's called 222 at 2, basically um, February 22nd at 2 o'clock was the last day that you could be at Standing Rock before you were arrested. And uh, the uh, iconic um, Water is Life image was done by uh, uh, Isaac Murdoch and um, Christy Belcour. And so and this is the, the, there's a, the latter version has the teepees on fire. So this is before I took the picture, uh, finished the painting and then in the latter ones it's, um, this is a, uh, another work that I did that's a little more sculptural. It's done with uh, metal letters and buffalo. And there's darts with, um, uh, on the very ends of them are synthetic human hair attached to the dart. And really the idea is that today we've sort of lost that connection between ritual and like something simple like hunting practices. Like do we don't really hunt anymore. We just go to the supermarket, we buy our food. And so, this is more like a game. This is like something you could have in your office or you could have it in your den and you could play darts and you'd shoot the buffalo or try to get, you know, pin the tail on the, the bullseye there. And that our culture is always changing. It's always evolving. It's either disconnecting from what is, you know, or the practices of our ancestors, but we're also moving forward in this very progressive momentum and we're letting all this information affect and change us. Some of it's good, some of it's bad. And I am only focused right now on the crea creative you know, approaches to doing things. So I just wanna wish everybody a happy Indigenous Peoples Day. I really appreciate you all showing up here and I hope that that's been uh, a great program for you all this evening or yeah. And um, I, all I can show you for now, but uh, thanks for coming and being here. All right. Um, if you have any questions, I don't know if we have much time. Do we? Okay. And if you don't want to stay, you can take off and do whatever. But right there, go ahead. Yeah. Is there any discussion in the um, indigenous peoples community about choosing? this particular day as Indigenous Peoples Day, uh, given that it was Columbus Day for most of the country, maybe. So it's about the redefinition of a holiday that I've known since I was a kid, which was Columbus Day. And so when we look at the, the the sort of the history of who Columbus was and when we're talking about genocide and colonization, then we have to also reevaluate what was his role in American history and and impact on indigenous people. So so we're at a place now where we are beginning to have not beginning, we have a really strong voice. So the voice is saying it's Indigenous Peoples Day, and we're going to celebrate that. Because that old hat perspective of Columbus was somebody else's idea, not ours. And so it's everything from re-erecting and you know, taking down statues of things that we no longer consider relevant. So we, we are moving to create our own holidays, our own voice, and uh, hopefully we can get a larger 
you know, consensus of people to, to follow along with it. And it could be a great day of celebration, another Thanksgiving perhaps. Uh, uh, thank you for an incredible presentation, both of you. Uh, I, uh, I think I have a question about next level art or next level uh, Native American art. And I, when in thinking about the role of the arts in um, social and political life, especially around Native issues, it seems like there's different ways of defining it. On the one hand, it's about tradition and heritage and honoring heritage and the role that the arts might play in that. And then also next to that, you, s you showed a lot of work that was um, ironic, very ironic or funny, you said, or, or that had an edge to it and an edge whose humor not everyone might appreciate, et cetera. So I'm just wondering if you or anybody sort of for the group in thinking about the role of the arts, that there's different sensibilities and different roles that they might have and how the honorific role sits next to the ironic role, I guess. Sure. <coughs> well, make no mistake when I call it next level indigenous native art. I truly believe, like I've been practicing art now, you know, as a contemporary Native American artist, 25 years, and so I've seen you know, the, 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 the chronology of everybody from Fritz Scholder to Oscar Howe and, and T.C. Cannon. And there have been all of these protagonists in terms of what defines contemporary American Indian art. And maybe around six years ago, I started seeing like little, like just explosive moments that where people were making, creating next level contemporary art. I'm like, wow, this is great. This is addressing this. This is, and so it's participating in the current conversation that I believe is relevant to all people. And so one of the things that was birthed out of Standing Rock was this idea that, hey, everybody, welcome to the tribe. This is what happened to us is now happening to you, to all of you. If you live in Flint, Michigan, your water's tainted. You know, if you thought that you were exempt from developments or or mining in your community or toxicity or you know radioactivity wake up it's happening to everybody and we're all being affected uh, and you know everything from addiction to bad food gmos welcome to this tribe man we're all one big human tribe so these conversations that are always tied right to um to culture to 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 a sense of, of connection to ceremony, to some traditional place where that, maybe I'm wrong, but Native Americans kind of have an edge on that. They kind of have this edge on like, man, we're connected to like the respect for animals, respect for environment. We're like some of the very first environmentalists. We're also like respectful of like all things like cosmos, like what, what's our relationship to the stars and what's, What's respectable and what's not respectable? What's sacred, what's not? Some of the things we're just asking for about what's sacred are really simple things. Grave sites, that shit's sacred. Like, let's be real. And so when, to, I hope I'm answering your question because it, it, it was a big question and this is a big answer. So um, I hope that's defining a little bit what I think is, I just believe that some of the artists that we're looking at here and what's happening right now is unprecedented. I truly believe that some of this work and, and the irony in the work is also sort of an invitation for you to like have a conversation about it. All good art stimulates dialogue. That's all it does. Because if you look back historically when people were practicing art at the time, people were like, de Kooning, that stuff's a mess. Those are ugly women. How dare him paint those things? And now we're like, oh man, he's got Pollock, the same thing. The things that we look back on at the time people didn't think was as relevant is some of the most transformational way that we perceive art today. And the things that we thought might have been good, maybe not so good, you know? They're trying to look at, what's the, oh, what's the impressionist guy? They, uh, uh, anyway, I don't want to get into it. <laughs> yeah, I better watch it. Um, anyway, uh, any other questions? I don't know, can I ask a question of Karina, if that's okay? Yeah. Um, so 
you spoke of the shell mounds as being sacred to your people in the region. Uh, we don't really talk about our massive deforestation of the Bay Area. Uh, I was wondering of what uh, were the forests that were here that are no longer or very in small supply. Uh, what were the importance of those uh, spaces to your people? Son? So, yeah, thank you for that. So, I mean, I think we, we need to think about it. Wherever home is, is sacred to us, right? And so, yeah, we used, we utilized the places that were here. Oakland was actually named because Oakland was filled with oak trees. It was a forest of oak trees. And we don't see them very often, right? Um, the hills of Oakland and Berkeley and the Bay Area was full of massive redwood trees that aren't here. And so when other folks got here, they said, oh, look at all this great wood. Let's cut it all down. And then there's some idiot came and said, hey, we have this, these seeds of these trees that grow really fast and planted all these eucalyptus that we're stuck with and I'm allergic to. And um, I think that, you know, when we live in places that um, if those things touch your heart or make you feel like something should be done about it, reforesting um, this place would be a great play, great thing to do. And that I would love to see some of those things happen where we actually have access to it. And not to just think of forest in the uh, hills, but to think of the people that live in the flatlands and the need to touch trees and the kids that don't get to do those kinds of things and the kids that don't get to play in creeks anymore and the kids that need to have those kinds of experiences as well. And so as we live in the Bay Area and we begin to reimagine what our home can look like, we can reimagine reforesting places um, in places that we wouldn't have thought of before. And I think when we're, we're talking about that, we're talking about a work that I'm also engaged in, and it's creating this wo uh, women's-led land trust in the Bay Area. It's the first urban women's-led land trust in the country where we're trying to buy back our indigenous lands um, and trying to figure out how it is that we can steward them in indigenous ways that welcome people to re-engage in the lands through talking about reforestation, we're talking about food um, places, we're talking about places where ceremony can happen, where people can actually touch the land again. And I think that that's one of the things that we are lacking as human beings that are brought up in the cities is that we don't have touching places to land anymore. Our kids only play on AstroTurf with soccer, um, and they don't actually get to actually play in the dirt anymore. And so as we begin to reimagine that stuff, yes, bringing back the forests that were important then are just as important now. I d actually didn't have a question. I just wanted to add that if you want to contribute to the land trust, there's a Shumi tax um, that is a voluntary tax that um, I think is something we all should be participating in. It's called the Shumi land tax. Is that right, Karina? Cool. And the website for that is? SigurateLandTrust.com. And you can find Shaumi. Shaumi in the Chochenyo language from this area means a gift. And in order for us to do the work, in order to buy back our traditional territory, we need everyone's help. And a way we were talking about the reciprocity of being on our land is to do that, is to help us to do that um, kind of work. And everyone can tr contribute in that kind of a way. Um, and so I, you know offer you guys to go look at the website and find out about a whole bunch of stuff about Ohlone history and to also um, participate in it. We had a gathering and you were down there at the webs uh, at the West Berkeley Michelle Mount today. It's Indigenous Peoples Day and we call it, um, and our friend who put that uh, together was encouraging people on Indigenous Peoples Day to give their tax for the year. Um, can everyone help me thank uh, Tony and Karina for an amazing dialogue tonight. Thank you. Thank you. I mean, if this doesn't work, but. <laughs>